Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Uh, my name is Valerie Forbes, and I am the Dean of the College of Science. And it is my pleasure to welcome you all here today. Um, this, is, this event is presented by FAU Center for Urban and Environmental Solutions and FAU's Office of Public Policy Events. Established in 1972, the Center for Urban and Environmental Solutions, or CUES as it's known to its friends, has been a beacon of innovation and collaboration, dedicated to addressing the complex challenges of urban and environmental issues. In this tradition, today's event focuses on how resilient and sustainable transportation and water infrastructure can support the demands of urban spaces in terms of economic development and climate impacts. We're thankful for the sponsorship of FAU's Office of Public Policy events, which promotes education and encourages civic engagement by organizing and hosting open discussions and debate forums. And many thanks to the following additional sponsors. The American Planning Association Broward Section, which provided the American Institute of Certified Planners continuing education credits that are available for this event. The American Planning Association Treasure Coast Section, which provided financial support the Palm Beach County Planning Congress for their support in promoting this event, and the Center for Equitable Transit-Oriented Communities, a USDOT-funded university transportation center, which provided personnel time to organize the event and ongoing support for Q's research, education, tech transfer, and workforce development. This is a great opportunity for FAU to connect to the professional community. So attendees will be earning CM credits for AICP in the four required categories. And those of you who are here, I'm sure understand that mouthful of abbreviations that I just spit out, so we're good. Um, law, ethics, equity, and resilience. The event will be recorded and available free of charge to anybody interested. Today, we're honored to welcome two esteemed keynote speakers who will enrich our discussions. One of those experts has come all the way from Paris for this event. Professor Nassima Barron is a distinguished human geographer and urban planning scholar at Gustave Eiffel University in Paris. She is joining us to share her insights on resilient and sustainable infrastructure. With her specialization in the geography of cities, environment, and mobility, Professor Barron's work spans across various countries, providing valuable perspectives on global urban challenges. Nasima is frequently a go-to expert for European media on transportation, infrastructure, and resilience topics in the European Union, France, Spain, and North Africa. We are also delighted to welcome Professor Billy Fields from Texas State University, who is renowned for his research focusing on understanding the key elements of resilient communities. His expertise in sustainable transportation and urban planning, coupled with his diverse background and experience, brings a unique perspective to the discussions today. Dr. Fields and Dr. Rennie have co-authored two books, Adaptation, Urbanism, and Resilient Communities in 2021, and Transport Beyond Oil in 2013. Additionally, Dr. Fields directs the International Sustainable Transportation Engagement Program that empowers students to learn from global experiences with a focus on cities in Europe and apply solutions to, creative, to create positive change in their communities. This workshop is the start of a larger collaboration with professors Barron, Fields, and Rennie. The group will be leading a similar workshop in August for the International Geographical Congress in Dublin. This upcoming workshop will be part of a special issue on resilient streets for the international peer-reviewed journal, Built Environment, to be published next spring. We're delighted to also welcome all of our other speakers who are also leaders in their field. And you can scan the QR code on the flyer. It's also on the screen. Or visit the Eventbrite page for full details. As we embark on today's discussions, let us embrace the wealth of knowledge and experiences shared by all of our speakers. The goal is to engage all of you in the discussion so that together we can explore innovative solutions to building resilient and sustainable infrastructure that can withstand the challenges of climate change here in South Florida. 
I also want to take this opportunity to let you know about our new School of Environmental, Coastal, and Ocean Sustainability, or ECOS, that we launched this past fall with FAU's Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute. ECOS is a multidisciplinary and multi-unit initiative that is the driver for diverse academic and research entities designed to create a comprehensive environmental hub at FAU. ECOS will leverage our outside partners, including many government agencies and educational institutions, combining the full breadth of partnerships with the university's teaching, research, and outreach mission. One of our core strengths in the College of Science is environmental education and research. We have experts in a diversity of academic disciplines from biological sciences and chemistry to physics and urban planning that are essential for solving complex environmental problems. We're in a prime location to lead the way with the Atlantic Ocean, Everglades, numerous freshwater ecosystems, all intersecting in the largest metropolitan area in the state. Add the impacts of climate change into this mix and it's clear we have our work cut out for us. And when I say us, I don't mean just scientists alone. We need scientists, of course, but also engineers, economists, social scientists, urban planners and designers, community and business leaders, healthcare professionals, and more. Our vision is to become a leading nexus of environmental education, research, and community engagement across public, private, and nonprofit sectors to create a resilient future that prepares and lessens anthropogenic impacts on South Florida ecosystems and human communities. Investing in research, teaching, and community engagement related to the environment is a top priority of the College of Science. We're prepared to invest our time and resources to moving this important work forward, and I hope that ECOS will serve as a catalyst for novel research and educational opportunities, both inside and outside of FAU. So thank you, John, Serena, and team for having me today to help welcome all of you to this workshop. Thank you. Um, good morning. I'm John Rennie. I'm, I'm the director of Hughes, uh, and I'm a professor in urban and regional planning here at FAU. And um, I, I want to just kind of um, introduce uh, our speakers uh, in a moment, but I just wanted to say a, a, a few things. I want to, again, thank all of our, our sponsors and partners for putting this on, uh, the, the local sections of the American Planning Association, Treasure Coast, Broward, um, Palm Beach Planning Congress. Um, I believe it is a partner on this one. I can't remember if they are or not. We're always partnering with them, so I'll, I'll give them a shout out regardless. Um, and, um, and, and our new uh, Center for Equitable Transit-Oriented Communities, I just want to take a second to talk about that. It, we received a, a, a consortium grant with the University of Florida, University of Colorado at Denver, University of Utah, and the University of New Orleans, which is the lead. It's a five-year grant, $10 million, and we are going to be working on trying to do research around equitable transit-oriented communities. I know a lot of you in this room are representing local governments and uh, local agencies, and uh, we would love to work with you. That's the whole intention of the grant, and we're just really getting that center kicked off. And so um, let's have conversations about that in the future. Um, I also want to take a moment to recognize that, you know, this, for those of you, including myself, that are AICP, American Institute of Certified Planners, and we have to get our credits, we con conceived this, this workshop to kind of get everyone to knock out all four of those one-hour credits that you need to, which means we're going to be in this room for a while. Um, you know, there's a requirement in terms of how much time we need to have these panels uh, in order to get those requirements. So... Feel free to get your comfortable. If you need to get up and walk around, you know, just feel comfortable. You know, um, the panels are all going to have plenty of time for, for Q&A. Uh, so, you know, let's have a conversation. The whole point of this workshop, the reason we're calling it a workshop is because we want it to be a conversation, right? A workshop is not a seminar. A workshop engages all of you, right? And I, I know because I'm going to be here for four hours. I hate sitting for four hours, right? So the more we can talk and discuss, uh, the more engaging it is, the quicker the time will go. And, um, and, and hopefully at the end of it, we'll have lots of good ideas and we won't want to leave and we'll want to come back together at some point, maybe in the fall or sometime soon. So without further ado, I would like to introduce 
um, my good friend and colleague, Billy Fields. Uh, Billy and I worked together at the University of New Orleans uh, some years ago. I kind of lost track now. We've been friends for a long, long time. I met him shortly after Hurricane Katrina when he was working at the Rails to Trails Conservancy. Uh, we had a job opening at the University of New Orleans. I encouraged him to apply. We worked together for a number of years. Uh, he went off to Texas. I came here. We continue to work together. Uh, Billy is uh, an outstanding scholar uh, and an advocate for sustainable transportation, walking, cycling, and resilience. Um, and so I'm going to just turn it over to Billy, and uh, he's going to present for about 20 minutes, and then we're going to hear from my new friend and colleague who I met last summer in Paris, Nasima, and then we'll have a uh, moderated session with uh, hopefully lots of good engagement from you all. So Billy, welcome. So I come, I'm in a political science department, and I come out of an urban planning, urban design background. So what I'm going to do for you today is we're going to start off with some ideas, and then we're going to look at some case studies and images to kind of warm us up. So I thought I would warm up with Española Way in Miami Beach. I was uh, there the other night, and it's just lovely and wonderful. And you walk, and you think, oh, this is lovely. And then you walk around the corner, and there's cars everywhere. Uh, and you think, why, why can't we have more places like this? And driving the ideas behind resilient streets are basically the concepts of how do we create more green, safe places for people to walk, bike, and access by transit. Uh, and, there's, and I'll explain in just a second, but that's the overarching sort of theme of what we're looking at. And the work that I did with John on adaptation urbanism basically looked around the world for case studies of places just like uh, Espanola Way that you have in the area here, and then searched for the kind of politics and policy choices that we can make to create more places like this. Let's see, go to the next slide. There we go. So what's, this is, some data slides, but just to kind of get us started. If you look at the United States and peer countries in terms of sanitation, we rank just as good as any other peer countries that are out there. If you look at the United States uh, compared uh, to other peer countries in terms of transportation fatalities, we are not doing as well. Uh, and I have the Netherlands, Spain, and the United Kingdom. There are lots of other countries out there. I just sort of selected those. Uh, and what you see is Spain, for instance, the green uh, sort of color there, was just about where the United States was 20 years ago. And Spain has made incredible strides in improving their transportation uh, safety system. And unfortunately, we've made some strides, but we haven't uh, improved at the same rate as other countries around the world. And the real question is sort of why is the US so much uh, higher in terms of our transportation fatalities and, and pollution rates? Next slide, please. And the real answer is that we have not followed best practices around the country, around the world. Uh, best practices uh, largely are around vision zero systems, safe systems basically focusing on changing the environment, and that by changing the environment and encouraging slower speed traffic, you create safer spaces. And largely, we, we haven't done that. Uh, there was research that was done in 2014 that showed that 20,000 fewer Americans would be killed annually and almost a million injuries prevented if we utilize those safe systems. And that was done in 2014. That was 10 years ago. Uh, what happens if we had made those changes 10 years ago? We would have saved 200,000 lives and pre prevented 10 million injuries. So these changes are small in community after community after community, but they add up to really large numbers over time. Uh, so that's the, the sort of large sort of policy issue that we're dealing with in terms of transportation safety. Next slide, please. And really the, the sort of core components here and what we're going to talk about today are some policies, uh, some policy background in terms of how these systems operate and function. And then what I'm going to do is show you some case study examples from Copenhagen, Amsterdam, Barcelona, London, Vancouver, New Orleans, and Texas. It's a wild tour that we're about to go on. Uh, lots of stuff in a short amount of time. And then I'm going to finish by talking with a couple of opportunities for Florida and how to think about these ideas that you see from around the world and how they can center in your own communities. So 
two large policy problems that we're dealing with. First is in terms of crashes and fatalities. Uh, there's somewhere around 40 to 42,000 crashes, crash fatalities per year in the United States, and that number has gone up from about 32,000 like five or six years ago. So we've seen a rise in transportation fatalities, largely driven by pedestrians and cyclists and people outside of cars. Uh, the transportation sector is also the largest sector for greenhouse gas emissions, somewhere around 28% of all greenhouse gas emissions. When you look at indirect sources as well, that goes up to about 40% of all greenhouse gas emissions related to the transportation sector. So if we're serious about climate change, we need to be serious about transportation emissions. And finally, it just takes up a lot of space. Uh, analysis of cities shows that 20 to 30 percent of all space is dedicated to roadways, uh, and those roadways are, tend to be sort of single purpose, moving cars. When you take parking into consideration, that figure can go up to 40 percent, particularly in downtown. So 40 percent of our space is dedicated to cars and storing cars. Huge numbers of fatalities coming from this sector and the largest amount of greenhouse gas emissions from coming from this sector. So that's, that's the problem, which is significant problems. But it also gives us some opportunities to think about what if we use that space differently. Uh, recent research has looked at what people want in communities and increasingly people want walkable, uh, bikeable streets as places to live. A recent National Association of Realtors a study showed that walkable green spaces were among the top amenities that people wanted in their communities. So we have, we have a problem, and then we have a desire by the public to live in places like that. If we marry those two pieces together, we have the opportunity to really rethink what resilient neighborhoods and communities are and begin to deliver those type of products that people really want. Next slide, please. So how, how do we compare? Uh, I live in Texas, uh, and it's, it's not doing great. Uh, you live in Florida, and it's not doing great either, sorry. Sorry to be the bearer of obvious news. Uh, but this uh, comes uh, from the US DOT, and they looked around the country to show how we compare. So if we can go to the next slide. I compared Palm Beach County, Broward County, and then New York City, just to kind of give you a sense of where transportation fatalities are. And if you look in New York City, uh, 38 fatalities from transportation in 2017. If you look at Broward, 237. Uh, oh, actually, 226. Sorry, I wrote the, I circled the wrong year there. <laughs> uh, and then in Palm Beach County, 162. Those numbers are not great, but unfortunately, they've gotten worse over time with 215 fatalities in Palm Beach County in 2021, 280 in Broward County in 2021 and then 48 here in New York City. Uh, and the interesting thing is the population, if you look at the population, uh, 1.7 million, 1.9 million, uh, and then 1.4 million. So you're looking at very similar populations, but very different results. And the reason that you have those different results is here there's a predominantly auto-centric high-speed transportation system, and in New York you have a mix. And when I showed you what makes the difference between our peer countries and the US, it's largely that same differential. And so creating those safe systems and opportunities for walking, biking, and transit are at the core of driving down transportation fatalities. And when you look uh, at the opportunities for change, what you see is that many countries around the world that you may have thought of that always had Great walking, biking, and transit didn't. In the Netherlands, for instance, uh, they had the same transportation fatality rate in the 1970s as we did. They just changed course. Uh, and so really learning from these countries around the world that are at the forefront of driving down fatalities is something that we argue in uh, adaptation urbanism that we need to do. Those same countries also drive down greenhouse gas emissions from the transport sector, and they also create great places to live. And so marrying all of those issues together really provides an opportunity for resilient communities. So what we did in adaptation urbanism is we looked at a series of different case studies 
uh, from around the world. We also, which we're not going to cover today, did a whole bunch of plan analysis that was really wonky and probably fairly boring. Uh, but we looked at resilience plans and looked at how they, how far, how close they were to meeting these sort of best practice standards. We aren't gonna cover that today. We're just gonna look at pretty pictures. Uh, so we looked at in the dark green, those were our case study cities. And then we also looked at an additional set of cities that were kind of emerging best practice leaders. What we found in our review of the literature is that there are four central components for creating really well done resilient uh, streets and communities. We call this adaptation urbanism. You're adapting your communities to climate change through great urbanism. Essentially, compact development, sustainable transportation, and green and blue infrastructure. Green and blue infrastructure sort of weaving these sort of natural and human-made systems of green and blue into the communities. And what they do is they soak up water, they deal with uh, urban heat island effect, and they create really fantastic communities for people to live. And what they do also is they drive up cost. So equity and affordable housing become really important issues because when you combine all of these things, people really want to live in these communities. And we've seen this over and over again. So to get out in front, equity and affordable housing become really important issues. So that's the sort of big ideas of resilience. Let's center it at the street level. What, what does it look like? It looks like safe systems and then green and blue infrastructure. And so I've said those terms a couple of times for you already, lots of jargon. So what I'll do in the next couple of slides is show you what we mean by each of those. So safe systems emerges out of Sweden. Uh, they call it vision zero there. The Netherlands calls it safe systems or sustainable uh, safety. I don't know why we can't get the same terms for the same thing, but the basic idea was in the 1990s, they looked at how uh, to create safe systems for, for moving around. And what they found was that just telling people to be safe wasn't effective. You actually need to change the environment to change decisions. So instead of putting up a speed limit sign and say, don't drive drunk, don't drive fast, you actually design the roadways for the speeds that you want people to go. Uh, the safe speeds. Um, and what we found was that that approach is really, really effective. And that approach caught on around the world. So the graphic that you see on the right here is it shows percent reductions uh, that have taken place over time for countries that have adopted this safe systems. And really, really, really effective at doing that. Next slide, please. Uh, and then what it looks like in practice, it's not rocket science. Uh, I'd like to tell you that we do all this analysis and it's super challenging and you need to hire me, but what, which would be nice, you can do that. Uh, but really what it is, is two different things in terms of roadways. Creating slow speed neighborhood streets. Uh, I was just in John's neighborhood in West Palm, and there are these great little uh, traffic humps that are put through. And traffic humps don't sound like they're great, but what makes them great is that there's green infrastructure on the sides, there's palm trees swaying. It's really, really lovely, and you get that, but it also is very slow in terms of cars moving through your neighborhood. You don't want high-speed traffic moving through neighborhoods. So that's the first element. If you do that, you're on your way. And then the next thing on higher speed streets, you have to have dedicated places for people to walk and bike. So sidewalks, safe crossings, and then for biking, you need cycle tracks and protected spaces. This is an example of a cycle track in Vancouver. There's a hospital right across the street. There's lots of activity and people moving through here, but they created this sort of cycle track. And when you create that type of system, along with safe pedestrian systems, you create a safe system overall. That's, that's the not rocket science part. Next slide, please. And then if you marry that to the green infrastructure, like we were just talking about the swaying palm trees, you don't have to have swaying palm trees. They could just be nice bio swales on the side of the road, but they soak up water. Uh, and increasingly we're seeing uh, more events of cloudburst storms, heavy rains, uh, and we're also seeing more periods of drought as well. So these bioswales soak up water and allow uh, the heavy rains to take place, and they also address urban heat island issues. So weaving these two components together really creates re uh, resilient streets. And in essence, the, the idea behind resilience, resilience can be seen as bouncing back 
or bouncing forward. Bouncing back after a disaster is just doing what you've done before. But most of the time, what you were doing before got you into the problem to begin with. So taking an idea of resilience as bouncing back just like locks us into the past and past decisions. And we argue that for resilience to be really effective, we need to think of it as bouncing forward. So we have the opportunity to bounce forward, to create safer places with more green space that decrease greenhouse gas emissions and create more livable communities. And now we look at some pictures, uh, places that have done this. So I found that it was like finding unicorns when you would find these places that had done both the safe systems approach and the green infrastructure. And John and I luckily got to go search for unicorns. Uh, and one of the places that we, that we found this was in Copenhagen. This is Tosinga Plads. There was a huge cloudburst event, billions of dollars of flooding damage. And the city of Copenhagen looked and they said, oh, how much is it gonna cost to expand our uh, water systems uh, through the gray infrastructure? And it was really, really expensive. And then they said, well, what if we use some of that money and we just took a bunch of old asphalt and turned it into places to store water and created these public parks throughout the community? And they found that it was cheaper and that it improved the quality of life. So this is an example above of what you saw in 2009 and by 2017, uh, there is this kind of depression where water will fill up. What you don't see is there's kind of actually a water storage tank underneath as well. But those two components together basically will soak up any amount of cloudburst that they have anticipated. Uh, and you also have this lovely little public park. There are new short stores and shops that have popped up around here. So it's a great public amenity. And the, one of the people I interviewed said, the point of Tosinga Plods is that it works when it's raining, but more importantly, it works when it's not raining. That's at the core of what resilient streets are about. They did the same thing about three blocks away because they, they have a, something like 500 resilience projects just in Copenhagen that they have planned. So they took this old traffic uh, circle, it's okay, uh, and they turned it into an urban forest from within two years. Uh, and what you don't see here is the new cafe that's popped up on the side. Like I said before, these things are really, really popular. They work really well, and they add community amenities. Uh, and it's important when you create these type of things to really be thinking long term about affordability. And as I said before, Amsterdam wasn't always Amsterdam. This is a street called Plantage Midden and the next slide I'm gonna show you is a sequence of how it's changed over the last 20, 30 years. So what you see in the 1970s is basically, it looks a lot like, the buildings look different, but the streets look very similar to the US. Kind of a four lane street, bikes are kind of thrown in there, cars are moving pretty fast, lots of fatalities, similar fatality rates to the US. By 2010, they had added a, that red space on the side as a cycle track. They'd added a cycle track to that space, improving, but that wasn't enough for them. So they took a three block section of this space and turned it into this uh, kind of what we call the street of the future. All streets don't need to look like this, but some of them when they look like this are great. Uh, and I take my students there in the summer and it's quiet and lovely and Trams move through here, and I always ask the students, how many people do you see? And they just count the number of bicyclists, and they're like four. And I'm like, the tram has 100 people on it. Uh, so you have this silent moving of like 100, 110 people, uh, and imagine 110 cars trying to go through the same uh, space. So really spatially efficient, green, and works well. Barcelona is attempting a very similar sort of system with their super ilas or super islands, I like this. It's basically this neighborhood change. So if you see in 2008, Barcelona, most of Barcelona looks like this, despite what their tourism board tells you. There are lots of cars, they're parked on the edges, uh, and it's not uh, a very pleasant place to walk because you have to walk around all the cars. So they said, well, what if we turned that into a central square for our community? And this is the exact same space. The cars slowly move around this green uh, space in the center, and the idea is to take that and then institutionalize it. This is just kind of the tactical urbanism version. London, uh, John and I also looked at. I just, I, this is just fun. Uh, they, Lon the uh, English have, are very flamboyant in terms of their protests, so they have a, pro a protest where they're gonna change the street, 
and they have a mock funeral for their business district. Oh, it's gonna be the end of the world. Uh, and then within several years, this same space is uh, designated as one of the coolest villages in London. The businesses, there's more business than there ever was before, and they interviewed one of the people who at the mock funeral, and he was like, I was wrong. <laughs> it's fine. The earth in, and the sky is not going to fall. It works really well. It creates great places. There are political challenges with each one of these projects that I've shown. So what we're really not talking about is the politics and push that it takes to make these changes. But this case kind of shows you what happens when you do in the possibilities. This is uh, what it looked like in 2008. And then the next slide shows you the small changes that have taken place over time. And what you don't see here is the tons of baby carriages that were there. I, I counted 15 different baby carriages in like 15 minutes. It's such a nice, comfortable, slow-moving space. Next slide. Uh, and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna speed up a little bit because we're towards the end, but you know, if we can make it in New York City, we can make it anywhere. So this is right in front of Macy's, uh, and they took the street and re uh, basically took part of it and turned it into a public plaza. It works great, it's lovely. Next slide. And a couple of examples from Vancouver to show you what it looks like in kind of a, a you know, smaller scale North American context. Little mini traffic circles, bioswales to take in water, Skateboarders, I don't know why skateboarders are always in my pictures in these areas, but it's interesting. And then little mini park traffic diverters. There are lots of different, this is like a toolbox of different things that you can use to create these resilient streets. And then in New Orleans, where I'm originally from, we took kind of an old street and then redesigned it uh, and added these little bio swales on the street. They're like little curb bulb outs. They slow cars and then they soak up water. And I wanted to just spend a couple minutes just at the very end to tell you about some opportunities for change. So last year, I uh, did a working group in San Marcos, Texas, right outside of Austin. And we basically pulled together people and we asked, what are the assets for resilient streets in our community? And the, the next slide. We found all of these amazing places in Texas that match just as well the best practices that you see around the world. And most people were kind of startled, and they were like, oh, wow, that's amazing. We have all of these in our communities now. The issue that we found was that they don't connect together. Uh, and so identifying what works is really important. And here are some examples. This is, I'm not an expert in this area, but I walked around, it was great. I found these little assets. Tying these assets together into a system is how you create resilient streets and change those greenhouse gas numbers change those fatality numbers, and improve livability all around. So uh, I, I think it's interesting to sort of think of this as an, an asset management issue. What assets do we have, and how do we pull them together to create better places? Rather than sort of focusing on the sort of negative side, what can we do to take what's already great in our communities and make it better? I think that's, I think that's it for me. Is that the next? Yeah, there we go. Cool. I uh, appreciate it, and then we'll have uh, Dr. Nasima Barron uh, next. Thank you all so much. Um, so yeah, we're gonna just jump next into Nasima. I met Nasima um, last summer while I was on sabbatical in Paris, and she was just so gracious, um, both personally and professionally. Not only did she tell me where to go in Paris, uh, to see great examples of these sorts of issues. Uh, but she also invited my family, my kids, to this wonderful park about an hour outside of Paris uh, where we went zip lining and my kids just had a phenomenal time. And so uh, even though I haven't even known Nasima for more than a year, it feels like I've known her for a lifetime. So welcome to FAU and thank you from, for coming all the way from Paris for a relatively short trip to uh, present to us. Thank you so much. Uh, it's, my, it's my great pleasure to be, to be here. It's okay? Bondage. So thank you very much for the invitation. I, I hope you will uh, understand <laughs> what, I, what I say. I'm very sorry. Well, I tried to, to speak. Anyway, um, so you, I will introduce two, two elements so in the context of resilience, uh, transport, cities, transition, uh, from my own, I would say, my own planet. So uh, 
I'm in Paris. I'm professor in, um, I teach in the Ecole d'Urbanisme de Paris, which is in next in this uh, university, which is, uh, um, next please. It's okay. Yes, it's in the east of Paris. So the new name is Gustave Eiffel because we've integrated uh, architecture, uh, engineer, um, uh, many of our specific, uh, I would say, research and teaching uh, equipments and buildings and, and institutions so that we enlarge uh, our, our university, which is a national one and which is focused on sustainable mobility, transport, and cities. So that it's a kind of thematic institution, so that in the Shanghai context, we have to, to scale up and to, to be bigger. So um, first, uh, I will introduce a, a kind of forward to put you in the context of great cities, uh, mass transit, and the future with uh, rail, metro, mass transit facilities facing climate change. Uh, so there are a very few slides about this, this kind of places, of, of spaces and of systems. Next. Uh, so what is a rail hub, a rail node in a metropolitan uh, city in Europe or in Asia? It's a, a, a tower, rail infrastructures, a kind of a specific place in the cities, which is a complex place, which is a horizontal, but as well vertical place. You have many floors to keep a, a regional train, a metro, high speed, something. So it's a connection place. Um, and you have as well, next, uh, um, a very big place uh, uh, with packed and crowded, especially at peak hour. So you have some, some facts and figures and numbers you see in Shinjuku, in Tokyo, um, on Shibuya station, uh, in Gare du Nord Paris, in London, not uh, King's Cross, but uh, Liverpool Street, you have these places which are really the, the, the node of the city in which you can connect from, from a, a, another country, then take a metro and go wherever you want. So in the, in, now in, in the world, you have this, uh, this place to be refurbished, transformed, and connected to more more lines of metro uh, and so on. Next, um, uh, yes, uh, sorry, mm. is this uh, a small film here in the top or not? No, it is not a, the, so it's a wrong uh, PPT because I had a film here. Uh, to, that was uh, seeing the flow and how it, uh, it's a busy place. Yes, and, uh, and it's also uh, a place in which you have uh, new uh, uh, wealth and money flows so that these places can enlarge, modernize, be bigger, so that uh, welcome more trains, more lines, more platforms, more people, and millions of people. So you can see in India, for example, the, the former Victoria Station, which is being enlarged to, to welcome crowds and crowds of millions of people, and to produce the kind of, they say, Rhinopolis, that is to say, it's a, it's a station, but it's as well a piece of the, of, the, of the capital, of the metropolis, with residential complexes, entertainment, uh, stores, retail, and many other activities. So in this context, then, uh, next, uh, I will introduce two, three, three elements. First, what's the problem with climate change and with the problem of heat, the specific problem of, of heat, which will be coming in this, in this kind of cities, and this kind of, of districts. And I will propose two oh, it's pathway or solutions and see how what are the limitations of these, these solutions, these adaptative solutions, and how we can go beyond. So first, the problem with, uh, with heat, with not heat, but urban heat. Next, please. Uh, <laughs> I took, I took a, a paper of uh, Bloomberg, the media, the US media, uh, in, in summer 22, and it was, um, it was a, 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 a news, an article after the, the, a problem that occurred 
in King's Cross Station. There was a, a, a heat wave in London in uh, July and August, but uh, especially July, the end of July uh, in London, a very difficult moment, uh, a real, uh, an extreme weather situation for some days. So the, the railway system was uh, not only disrupted, but damaged. And as you see here with the special notice, you come to King's Cross and there's no, no rail, nothing, nothing, nothing to, to, go, to go anywhere. So they, they closed the, the, all the stations. So the, the Bloomberg um, asked, is the US prepared to such uh, disruption, to such a problem that, he's, that hit produces on this complex rail and urban systems that are so complex, so packed, so crowded. So that was the, the introduction. And so the, the, the article developed next uh, about urban heat. So we have weather extremes in, the, in, the, in July, in August, sometimes in June as well, and it's September. So weather extremes, but as well a kind of new normal, hotter, uh, ambience uh, in cities that's uh, connected to the problem of urban heat island. That is to say, uh, the city centers are hotter than the periphery and the rural places. So, about microclimatic conditions within cities, then the free 30s, that is to say, 30, but it's in degrees. Some, Sorry, it's in, it's in uh, European uh, Celsius degrees. But you have, when you are above 13 degrees, above 13 um, uh, milligram in hygrometry, that is to say wet, wet air, and 30 kilometers per hour for wind, that you have, can have fires as well, then it's a, a, a threshold of insecurity for the systems. And we have, you have also this these trends, these heat extreme weather periods will be much more probable, much more intense and longer in the future. So we have to face and to prepare and anticipate this context. But especially in cities, but especially in these rail hub or rail districts. So next. Um, and I have here to explain that these systems, you had photos, aerial photos, are, are systems, special systems like an onion with layers from the core to the periphery of these rail hubs. So if, if I can explain how uh, this rail hub will adapt to the heat conditions, Let's see the various layers, the various from the core to the periphery of these systems. So first, next please, we have the, and, I, and John, I took uh, an example of any uh, rail hub in, in France, and I took the capital of, uh, of Brittany, French Brittany, which is Rennes. So I took the rail station, the rail hub. So here you have this, uh, this uh, tracks, you know, tracks, right land. So it's part, the first part, the core park, is tracks, platforms, depots. So this industrial part to produce metro and, 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 and train, regional train services. So it's a part of the system. Then next, we have the building. The building, the hall to welcome passengers, which is in this moment being redone in Europe and in Asia. So it is second layer, the station buildings, and you have vertically, of course, uh, park, um, parkings, or, or so car parks, or everything. But it's in building. Then the third uh, space, it's the forecourt connecting to light rail, buses, bikes, uh, especially uh, uh, Bill in, in uh, Netherlands and, uh, and, and Denmark, but in many other uh, countries and cities now. Uh, so the intermodal hub is really connected to the rail hub. It's part of the same system because people went by bike, go by bike to the station and then take a metro or something else to, to go to work. And so in this moment, in a, a very normal uh, average uh, rail hub, you have pedestrians, bikes, like 
cars, uh, metro, bus, motors, regional network, national network, and so on. And in the future, when the mobility flows are, will be bigger, so by 2050, there will be an increase of average 40 percent of this flow. You will have as well scooters, ride hailing, segways, floating cars, autonomous cars. So you have to get a, a, a place for this connection outside the building to make a, a rail hub efficient. Next, of course, you have this TOD approach and you have a, a, a development or brownfield redevelopment area because part of these rail hubs were as well freight or industrial land, which has been revalued with a rail redevelopment, just as in King Cross London and many other uh, examples. So this redevelopment area adds residential uh, buildings, offices, stores, and many other uh, buildings near or in, in, the, in the periphery of this system. And if we can even go larger in the next, in this, and so I took an example, Northern London, because now with the HS2, which will be added to the high speed one line in, uh, in UK, and you will have, you've already in St. Pancras, the European high speed to come to London, and then the HS2 is going to Manchester. So you, ha you have only to, to, to transfer from one rail hub to another, 10, minutes, 10, 15 minutes walk. So you have various rail hubs coalescing one with another and um, uh, shaping a um, walkable district that is completely um, uh, uh, key in the development, of course, of the capital, we, and we, in which you have great universities, museums, and, and important uh, places and services of the, the capital which are relocating there because it's a very interesting place. So, for example, you have the National Library. So, all these layers are connected to the problem of heat now. That's, we will, that's what we will see. Next, please. So, first, when we have this, this perspective, this vision of these different spatial layers, let's see the urban heat rising. Please, next. I only took um, a thermal photograph of some French cities that you could have done with uh, other, many other cities. You have 99% chances of seeing uh, an urban high island within the urban island, I, I, I mean an uh, overheated district in the place of the rail hub. You, you see what I mean? It's not the urban island, it's the, an urban island in the rail hub that is much hotter than the urban heat, which is already hotter of the general area. So I can give you uh, numbers, but you have, uh, I'm sorry be, we, with the, the, the European numbers, but at um, five degrees more the city with the rural, and five degrees more the rail hub than the capital. So it's began to be quite uncomfortable. Next, why? Two, main, two, two big causes, ma many criteria, but in left, you have this rail soil land that is dry and hot, dry uh, and dark, sorry. So you have a problem of albedo, refraction, we're not here for a, phys a core of physics, lecture of physics, but you understand that you have very dry, it is a kind of desertic con uh, conditions. And right, when you are in Shibuya, in, in the dense Hong Kong and Japanese or London uh, context, but you have a very, very dense uh, land use model with high rise towers. So you have this problem with no wind, you are, you are in a, a kind of overheated place. You cannot breathe anymore and it's quite uh, difficult. That's the problem. But the second problem is that, in, as you saw in uh, London in July 22, the, everything collapsed. That is to say, I, I try to explain 
two, two, two levels, gray and uh, pink uh, color. You have this uh, the, uh, uh, summer, a uh, summer day, and uh, the temperature becomes to rise but, uh, at the end of the morning, about noon, beginning of the afternoon, temperature is more and more important. Then the first uh, uh, reaction of uh, rail managers is to slow down the train speed because it helps, it prevents the buckling, that is to say the melting of the steel of the tracks. Take care, try and slow, slowing down. Surface train, but the many surface train come to this hub. When many trains are delayed, first uh, the the whole network, uh, metropolitan network, is disorganized. So in the gray uh, uh, cycle, you see what's going on in the rail management area, so the technical part of the manager. And the more you have trains disorganized, the more you have people waiting at the station for the train to come, because the train is delayed, it's slow, so we, we wait. And the more you have people, the more you have crowd, the more you have crowd, the more you have anthropogenic heat, because people themselves uh, make heat, in fact, in, in these packed places, so it's not very, very good. So that's the disruption point. And we have to, in the, in the end of the afternoon, the beginning, the, the bed temperature go better and better in the, in the evening, that's a recovery moment in which bottle, people give bo water bottles to the passenger to to, to tackle with the conditions. So in France, we are, we are given water bottles to stay in this platform under the sun for half a day. And um, slowly, the, manage, the rail management is reorganized and the trains go their way. So till the normalization, the resilience, because it's a resilience functional model, very, very normal. So heat disrupts these rail hubs, it can damage infrastructure, and, and it disorganizes the servicial dimension of these different uh, services. Next, please. Can you put this, perhaps, can I have this, this film? Because I had the, the, the other. So it's the end of the day. We had a long, a long uh, day, and we have these crowds who ask themselves how they will go home tonight, and they are, so they are quite, uh, so, so the, the station is so uh, packed that nobody moves, the trains don't move, so it's a, a, a moment of, uh, of uh, insecurity and emergency. So it was to, to contract with the first film, I couldn't put, with that all this flow, is choreography was doing well, and now there's nobody, no, no movement, no choreography uh, more. So that's the problem. Next, please, if we can go. Cape. Um, yes. Next, please. Um, no, no, no. Less. Sorry, sorry. I think we've um, before. Back? Yes, this one. One dead disruption is the disruption functional model left. You have a normal state, then you have this cliff, a disruption point, then you recover until you get a normal situation. The very problem is that the one day, if you have it every day, you have a quite problematic Riles Hub summer. And I, I saw you, I, I, I explained you in this um, seasonal uh, resilience functional graph that you have this everyday uh, disruption till the closure, the real closure of the station which occurred in King Cross in July 22. So this is the problem at the 
core of the system, the rail system. And we will see the impacts on the broader, uh, on the wider uh, dimensions of, the, of this system. So next, please. The problem is, of course, the mobility system of the capital, because you come and you go uh, to this rail hub with bike, with buses, with uh, everything. So when the, when the hub is uh, closed or limited in its uh, performance, it's all the mobility, sustainable mobility system of the city that is broken. And some um, uh, studies and surveys have been done, especially in France, when, uh, that, that shows that people will, in these situations, will stop using their metro and, and regional rail system. They will come back to car because it's much better. They are inside the car. They, 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 they have a good temperature. They have the music. And they are OK to go to the, to the work and no more with this mass transit systems. So there is a, a, a model shift between uh, sustainable mobilities and car mobilities if we do nothing because when the rail hub is closed, we have to find other solutions to move. So, and, and you see, uh, in case of hot, uh, of heat extremes, um, public transport, even uh, bike is con and, and, and walk, is considered, I don't know, I don't say it is, but is considered to be very unpleasant or unpleasant. So next. Uh, I, will, I will try to, to uh, I think we, we've uh, sk skipped one, one first presentation. I show you, next, back please, uh, won't be too, too, let's be back, we'll, it's, and be back one. So I try to explain you two pathways, two solutions that have been developed. The first, please back. No, there is a problem in the slides, but let's go. Well, we, we are here in Netherlands. In Netherlands, you have uh, uh, left these railway systems, Den Haag, Rotterdam, Amsterdam, Delft, and people live in one city, go to another by train, work, and then go back, and then take your bike uh, in the bike uh, park of, the, of, the, of each station. So they can have two bikes in each place. And this is connected to a vision of urban planning that is necessary. Um, Dutch people, it's a planning, Dutch urban planning school, think they want to keep this polycentric urban system, that is to say, nodal cities which good, with good connection between one another, because, and then city in each city, so that they keep space outside the city, void space, empty space, for what? For stocking water, because they are below sea levels, and, the, and if they have dense cities, they have space to, to, to be resilient, but to be climatically resilient, to store water, because they need it. So it's not only a problem, you, you see these rail hubs of uh, transport resilience, it's a problem of territorial survival and resilience in the future, because it's so important to have various cities with good connection and, and mass transit. Um, so please, next. So they did, so I present a, a, a survey, a, a study they did, because I con I'm connected with these various uh, European rail uh, expertise, uh, engineer expertise, from uh, Spur Belt, that is to say Spur is track and Belt is built in German, is the image. They want to, to sustain, the, to foster a good image of rail that will tackle with this challenge. So they did um, uh, uh, statistical and cartographical analysis of their 400 rail hubs in the country, in, in, in Netherlands, and they saw that a big part of these uh, 
rail hub was exposed either to heat, it's the map uh, above in red, so heat waves can uh, be important in this country, as well, of course, as flooding and water submersion. This you, you know much here. And uh, a third of the uh, stations were exposed to heat as, so, as much, it was a, the, the problem is as serious as the water, the pro, the water problem in, in Netherlands. So please, next. They did this, uh, this uh, survey, so you have, I get, give you these images of these big, important, emblematic, iconic uh, rail hubs uh, in, in Netherlands, and they try to find green solutions to try to shade and to protect and to adapt this rail hub with green solutions, nature-based solutions. That is this pathway, this Dutch solution. So next, what did they do? They're, they're really a profile with uh, several indicators, uh, such as heat stress, drought, land subsidence, uh, damage for storm. They profile each of their uh, rail hub as a space in, with the neighborhood, with the rail, but also the urban parts, as I presented, the urban parts, the residential district, the store, uh, the, the, the bike part, everything. So it's a, a special system, broadly speaking. So they do this uh, very precise uh, analytics, and then they act, and they produce solutions, please. Next. So it's I cannot develop all, all <laughs> 400 stations. So I took Assen, which is a small one in northern uh, uh, Netherlands, in the line toward Groningen. And Assen Hub adaptation consists in uh, caring about, so it's a recent uh, refurbishment with a new building, a timber canopy with wood, uh, which produce a continuous shaded platform. So much more than the tracks or the building, it, it, it protects a, a great um, um, place in which you can have the cars, the bikes, the buses, everything. Of course, an important bike park area. And they protect as well, you see in the, in the map uh, here, they protect a forest very near of the station. You see here, the, 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 the green place. That helps to soften this overheating moment and to give a kind of refreshing, cooling uh, impact in the rail hub. And it helps, it helps, uh, uh, it's, it's efficient. So it's a first proposal, a first way of acting and adapting. So it, then they produce, we, we work one another between countries in Europe and this idea to shade and to, pro, and even in the four courts, here it, it is in Paris, but we, we don't plant trees and wait till they are big, because we will uh, wait for the shade. So we produce the also gray solution, textile shading and all this uh, stuff, with design, architect, innovation. And loads, loads of So second, second ID, so well, and the shading becomes to be important uh, and transforms even the functional dimension of these hubs. You can see the waiting room is no more a room, it's a garden outside the station. So it's an open air waiting room. So it's a garden, in fact, with chairs, and you have the pl number of platforms to wait for. Under a tree or in the shade in the sky. So that's the nature based adaptation. Then the, another pathway, another solution, which is developed, uh, of course, both paired or mixed or hybridized, but the second comes from the French expertise and it's connected to two electricity and two energy. So uh, I explain, please, next. Um, the, the audit, the technical audit, comes from another vision of the problem. 
It's no more this idea of the tracks who melts bec buckle because of this heat. The French people say the weakest point of the rail, rail hub is the electric grid. And uh, these components are much more exposed to, to also to melt or to, to go in a bad way with the heat. And that's true. In fact, that's quite true. So you see this photo in a rail hub, you have the steel infrastructure and you have the electric infrastructure to feed the movement of the trains. Yes, yes, Jen. So this, uh, this electric demand of a rail hub is huge. Oh, in a heat, in a heated day, everybody takes his climate at home. In the rail, in the rail district, which is so dense, everybody takes his own climatization at home. The the consequence is blackout, fragilization of electric system in the rail con in the rail part, and overconsumption in the residential part goes to next a very big problem. So every nothing when you have a blackout in a, in this kind of rail hubs, you have trains in tunnels stopped. So kind of problem, people in lifts, not so pleasant. Uh, big, big, big problem, I, even to cyber security problems. And it's complicated in Europe because of terrorism security. So all cascading effects begins to go very bad if we have an electric problem during a heat wave. So it's another uh, cascading uh, problem which goes from this heat, heat moment. So please, next. Uh, so French people say, I, we want our rail hubs to be, energetically speaking, autonomous. We will have to protect our own bubble of rail hub system. And the best way to do this is next, to produce our own. So it's not much the planning culture of Dutch people. Water is bad, heat will be bad, and they take this, this fear of water submersion and they connect it with heat of climate risk. You see this uh, De Gaulle man who wanted France to be nuclear, uh, autonomous, energy autonomous. So we have this idea to make our critical key urban infrastructure safe because we can control it. But how to control, and you see here is the left is the electric grid of France, the uh, right is the rail system of France. Isn't it the same? So, Please, next. So what we do in France is considering all a rail hub as an energy and flow system. And we convert all these movements uh, of people, uh, of densities, of, uh, of everybody into a heatscape and a heat image. Then next. And we try to have a metabolistic approach, that is to say, energy, make train move, and then is recuperated with the braking system into uh, lightning of the station, and then is recuperated as uh, in order to make the digital uh, screens for the platforms. And it goes in a circular way. It's reused, that's the idea. So it's a metabolistic approach of every uh, cycles of, of flows, energetic flows, and all the flows, and even material flows. Next, when, where do we go? I take the Nice Airport's new rail hub station, and you have this, another canopy with solar panels. Solar panels help rail hub to be autonomous, electrically speaking, so to prevent these disruptions, these big disruptions, so this cover this very big cover with solar panels, um, um, solar roofs uh, on the platforms, and the, the tower in two is not a residential building. Please, next. It is an adiabatic tower. So when you go to La Mecca in Saudi Arabia, you see these traditional wind tower that produce fresh air 
uh, in the, in, in the, in, through tunneling and then elevating air. So it's a low-tech solution from Arabian countries of the Middle East. And it's the first time it's been included in a European Right Hub. So I finished, John, with a conclusion to show you that there are two ways of anticipating this uh, resilient pro climate resilience problem in Right Hubs. Please, next. Conclusions and takeaway, very few ones. First, we have a lot more to, please, uh, next. We have a lot more to, not only to discover, to study, to research. I am, <laughs> I am a, a scholar, so I am in this. I have to make research forward. Because uh, um, not only with rail uh, makers, which are in the core of the system, but as well as the urban planning makers who are in the uh, vicinity and the neighborhood of rail uh, hubs and who are part of the game because they use electricity, they need uh, fresh air, and so on. So we have to engage all the stakeholders, a very simple stakeholders, planning authorities, transit agencies, uh, promoters, in this vision that it's key to refresh this part of cities. So it's first a challenge for research, for transdisciplinary research. Second, it's a challenge to implement quickly design adaptive solutions. You see this gray, this green solutions, gardening, uh, creating uh, uh, devices such as the adiabatic tower can be done, of course, with money, but as well as reprior reprioritizing of the goals of the planning of these places, because we have to make room for these places. Perhaps a smaller of bike parks or car parks, I don't know, because we need much time and place and room for this. And third, third, uh, so next, next. And third, uh, we have to, to, to raise large amounts of money to change big rail hubs. Because what is done now is in relatively small or medium-sized rail hubs, because they are smaller, that is to say, the, the, even the stakeholder system is more simple. But you go to, 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 to Tokyo down, downtown, you go to London downtown, you have so many institutions that, uh, that uh, to, you have to make them agree of a huge investment. So we have in this uh, to make uh, heat and cool an asset and to include it in this approach of uh, land value and value creation of rail hubs. And it's an economic problem, but I think it's also very critical. So thank you very much and sorry for <laughs> being too late. <laughs>